були мастер-клас конференція відомого продюсера, музиканта, який зробив кар'єру за 25 років в Америці і світі. Він зробив таких речей, як Моби, Гвен Стефані, Foo Fighters, Бек, Джейнс Блант, Бернсайд, Пойзен, Моторхед і дуже багато інших цікавих і дуже відомих людей. Це людина, який має в Гіннесі запис, що найбільш продаваємо пластинку в цьому тисячолітті. Это он сделал эту пластинку. Это человек, который взял людей с улицы. Они не были звездами никто. И э, э, их сделал кем-то. То есть он нашел в них уникальное что-то и сделал их звездами. Это и Бек, и Моби, и Шейнс Бланд. И мне очень интересно это сделать здесь, на открытии нашей школы, особенно в это время э, и пригласить моего друга, очень интересного продюсера и музыканта, Том Ротфорка. Springsteen when I was a little boy starting out befriended me and he told me a story first he told me how fun it was to make the Bruce Springsteen record born in the USA and sell 10 million albums yep. and then he told me a story about recording Bob Dylan and Bob Dylan just started to play a song in the studio and he realized that he was about to sing and there's no microphone he ran over and put the microphone up to Bob Dylan and held it while he did the song <laughs> and it went on the record and he said So people say, what is a producer? Well, that day, a producer was a microphone stand. Я буду це перекладати зараз. В Америці є такий дуже відомий музикант, називається Брус Спрінгстін. І Брус Спрінгстін один раз був в студії з Боб Диланом. Боб Дилан – це дуже відома людина в Америці, також дуже відомий артист. І коли він почав співати, Боб Дилан, він зрозумів, що в нього не було мікрофона. І Брус Спрінгстін побіг до... Боб Дилан і дав йому одразу мікрофон. Він запитав, чому ви так робите? Він каже, ну, я ж продюсер, я купив мікрофон. Так що він мені таке саме дав. Дякую, Тон. Дякую. Так, що ми маємо дуже свіжу аудіенцію, яка має багато питань. І в вашій опитанні ви зробили щось, що дуже багато людей вважають. Ви вважаєте від базиту бути a normal child growing up in Northern California. <laughs> normal. <laughs> normal child growing up in Northern California. Yeah. I mentioned Northern California. <laughs> yes. And then uh, you became one of the most successful producers of all time uh, in, modern, in modern history and in modern music. Uh, the songs that you produced became soundtracks of people's lives. Uh, they became basically hymns, especially a song, You're Beautiful, of James Blunt or Beck, Loser. To me, personally, Beck, Loser was my, one of my favorite sounds that I heard when I heard, what is that? A drum on the slide? I never heard that before. Yeah. And uh, I thought that was the most incredible thing. And in fact, when we met, and somebody told me you did Loser, to me, that was the most biggest achievement in my life. Like, I met the guy who did Loser. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I actually was chasing that sound for a long time. And I didn't know how to do that. I'm like, oh, well, I'm very happy that you're here. Я говорю людям, що мені дуже задоволено, що я маю Тома, бо він зробив дві моїх улюблених пісень, які мене ще надихнули в 91-му році. Одна називається Loser Back, 
А друга пісня це You Beautiful, Джейн План, коли я вже був дорослий і вже мав свою кар'єру. А, і ці дві пісні для мене це мій саундтрек. Тому мені, мені завжди було цікаво знати, як спродюсувалася ця пісня. Мені завжди було цікаво, звідки ці ідеї пішли. So, uh, the first question I have, how did you start to become a producer? Like, how, like how do you start to become a producer? Mm. I, and I have to say, too, uh, for me also to be here, to be the first, uh, and there will be many master classes with many amazing people. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be here and to be able to uh, speak and share with you all today. Uh, it's really an honor, and I, I look forward to seeing who, who comes after as well. The... Uh, um, for me, becoming a producer, at first, there's no, you know, nobody, no, yeah, there's no, uh, like if you're a lawyer, you can take an exam and then you're officially a lawyer, right? Right. You, how do you become a producer? The, uh, uh, you don't, there's no accreditation. And so at first, when you have a dream to make music with people, uh, at some point you have to say out of your own mouth, you have to say, I'm a producer, but you're really not because you're, you just, everybody starts off as a person. Yeah. So that's, a, that's the, you know, you, and for me, I just liked music. I listened to records over and over and over. Not very many, just a few records. Beatles, Sgt. Peppers. I was four years old, my parents said, you can just have this record because they didn't like it. So yeah. I said, you play this one, you can. <laughs> doesn't matter. And so, yeah, I just listened to music and then eventually, uh, in university, I got the opportunity to record a band on a, on a four-track cassette. Mm -hmm. And that's when I discovered, like, oh, I have all these ideas that I didn't know I had because I've listened to a couple records so much. I've studied them so closely, being a fan, that I suddenly could say, if you were playing a guitar, I'd say, oh, hold that last note, note out over the third verse. That would be cool. Mm -hmm. And suddenly these ideas came out of nowhere. So for me, that's I became a producer... Uh, uh, not through a music school, but by being in university and being allowed access to the equipment. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, по-перше, він хоче uh, подякувати, що у нього є така можливість бути першим в такій uh, академії в Україні. Uh, це для нього дуже важливо, і він дуже дякує за, за таку uh, подію. По-друге, як uh, робиться продюсер? Ну, однозначно, якщо хто, хтось хоче бути адвокатом, то є школа для того, і вчишся на адвоката. А як же продюсер? Що таке продюсер? Він цього не знав. В той час не було таких навіть шкіл, де було продюсерство. І він просто любив дуже музику. Він слухав пластинки більше і більше один до одного, один до одного. В кінці кінців він зустрів людину, яка сказала, ви знаєте, от, наприклад, якщо зробити цю ноту чуть вище, а цю нижче, воно краще зробиться так і так. А це був його перший продюсерський урок. Як робити продюсерство, що це означає. Тому... Як зробити це продюсером? Він прийшов в свою школу, вона не є академічна, але він зараз нам все розкаже, як вона є. So that's why we're going to ask you all the secrets about producing. <laughs> You're not going to escape with a question here. So, okay, well, so you started producing. Uh, does it mean that you started producing, analyzing the record, the sound of it, analyzing the instruments, or analyzing the songwriting? How do you start with it? Hmm. Well, I'll tell you. A, I'll tell you a bit of my story. I'll just tell you. And then, uh, my third year of university, I decided I had a college radio show as a mm -hmm. DJ, playing records. Then I had the opportunity to record my very first song, and on cassette. And then I recorded a whole album. And then I went to the shop and I photocopied the cover mm -hmm. and I sold the cassettes on consignment at the local indie record shop. So in one summer, my third summer uh, break from college, small town, small stuff, my friend's band, I had produced an album, not very well. I had uh, manufactured it, about 15 copies, and I'd sold it at the local record shop, and I went back and they gave me money for it. <laughs> and so I thought I was ready to, you know, be the next Quincy Jones or something. I was, well, I, this, uh, well yeah. that's very interesting. Um, this is a, a business B2B 101. <laughs> <laughs> Дуже, дуже цікавий урок, я вже навчився щось. Він каже, я почав як робити продюсерів? Я почав робити свої пісні, була група якась, мені подобалася, я почав їх записувати, на що було, і зробив касети, і ті касети я пішов в локальний магазин, почав продавати, і перші гроші пішли звідти. Думаю, все, я вже продюсер, буду вже Квинси Джаунс. And uh, so at the end of that summer, I thought, well, I've done everything I can do in the small town. I have a college radio show, I got paid to play top 40 records on the pop station, and I, I made a, a record, and uh, 
So now I moved to Los Angeles. Uh, I stopped university. I say, this is my dream. Now I know what I want to do. I've discovered that I, I will record music. And, uh, and so I went to Los Angeles, and I had an apartment stand for four weeks. And uh, I photocopied my resume, and I went to all recording studios every day, and I gave it out and said I would like a job, any job. And they all said, they didn't say anything, no. <laughs> and finally, the last week, I thought I was going to have to go back home, the uh, studio called up. The village called and said I could have a job, and Cherokee said. Cherokee called first, and so I went and I became a runner for $3 an hour. And that's when I started to learn the tradition. So I thought I was already advanced in my own mind because I'd done all these things in a small town. But in Los Angeles, I, you know, my first job was to go pick the cigarettes out of the bushes around the building, right. uh, day one. Yeah. Well, okay, this is 101, not that fun. But, <laughs> but I guess that's the, that's the path uh, that pretty much everybody goes through. Jak він почав далі працювати як продюсер? Він вже в коледжі, на третьому курсі коледжу, він подумав, все, мені вже, вже достатньо вчитися в коледжі, я вже продюсер великий, я вже продаю свої касети в локальному магазині. Думаю, все, я кидаю коледж і переїжджає він в Лос-Анджелес. В Лос-Анджелесі він має резюме, Творить своє розуме, що він там десь там в містечку зробив якісь там вже касети, і воно продавалося. Він думав, що він вже дуже великий. І насправді ніхто йому не дзвонив назад. Він не розуміє, чого не дзвонив. В кінці кінців подзвонили дві студії, запросили його працювати за три долари за годину. Він думав, що він вже був дуже успішний, бо сказав, а студії приїхали, дають три долари за годину. Насправді його робота була прибирати навколо студії ті, хто курить. And, that, and that's where, that was 1987. Mm -hmm. But the difference today is that many of those recording studios don't exist, and there aren't as many sessions. And back then there was a tradition that you could come in, which I was one of the, the last generation of people that could come through that studio tradition. And the, I worked at two studios, Cherokee, and I worked at Record Plant for, as a, the lowest guy in the studio. But because of that, they showed me everything. They showed me how to repair a studio, they showed me a basic recording, how to set up a session. Uh, I worked on a scoring stage. I worked in a remote, remote recording truck, all within a little over a year. And that's where, that doesn't exist so much today. And that's where an academy like this comes into play because what that provided was a forum for people that knew the tradition to come together and, uh, and teach new people and continue carrying on the tradition. So that, now, you know, those don't exist so much, but uh, here we have the opportunity to do a similar sort of thing. And that's uh, skipping ahead. That's what gets me excited well, about being thank here today. You, thank you very much. Uh, well, I'm, you get me excited about this. Він говорить, що так як він там прибирав територію в студії, не працював в студіях, він ще не мав можливості робити, але в кінці кінців за один рік йому давали в студії прибирати всюди. І він почав дивитися, яка є апаратура, як вона працює, як записується. І він знизу пішов, просто все розумів, яка є апаратура, як працювати з людьми, як поставити мікрофон. ハトメイクマイクフォーエクサンプルハトメイクマイクフォーエクサンプルハトメイクマイクフォーエクサンプルハトメイクマイクフォーエクサンプルハトメイクマイクフォーエクサンプルハトメイクマイクフォーエクサ
James Blunt will introduce those three. Very glad. James Blunt much later. You will. Apparently. And today he started looking for artists, groups, which he liked. He brought them to the studio for one hour. He recorded them and taught them how to do the sound, how to make it sound, how to make it sound, how to make it sound. In this way, he taught them how to do the sound in the studio. So, and then, uh, okay, you haven't met James Bond yet, and uh, you're working in these studios, I understand, so, so you start getting a day job, or how do you survive? Uh, I survived from the five, three dollars an hour, the first job, the second job, uh, five dollars an hour, and so I survive off of that during the day, mm -hmm. and then at night I start to record a little bit on the side, and uh, I found a studio that had a lot of MIDI, which was new at the time. Mm -hmm. And I started working in that, I got up to $10 an hour. And then I was engineering, making uh, Mexican records. So basically, Mexican records. Right, we'll okay. get to that yeah, in the last market. market. Okay, this is very interesting. And uh, so MIDI, the new technology basically made you at that time. something interesting. Yeah, I saw something. Mm -hmm. In the tradition of the studios, you couldn't really get in the room and work hands-on. You couldn't really get around the artists. Uh, for, it took years. Yeah. But with MIDI, uh, it was a new technology, and not very many people knew it. So I learned uh, this MIDI room that was inside the record plant, and that yeah. allowed. And big producers at the time, like Don was, were using that to do their keyboards. Mm -hmm. So I realized that if I train myself in this room, only guy who knows this room is the owner. He's got more work than he can do. If I learn his room without anybody knowing, then I'll just tell him, "Hey, I brought a project in there. And I learned his room. I paid him. I made him money to learn his room. Mm -hmm. Then after I was done, I said thank you." Uh, and uh, by the way, I know your room now, so if you've got any extra work, and that's when I started getting my hands on it and doing it. And that was the beginning of hip hop breaking in America mm -hmm. and becoming mainstream. And so I did tons of hip hop and R&B stuff in there. Mm -hmm. uh, song demos, Burt Backrack came by, Bruce Roberts, all in songwriters, Latin records, and uh, jingles, all kinds of crazy stuff was in that room. And uh, and I was the only guy in there. And if, mm -hmm. if you know if I didn't know what I was doing enough, the session would stop, and I made mistakes, of course, but we, you know, we got through it. <laughs> it, was, it was good. Я запитався, ну як він далі виживав. Тож він мав три долари за годину, потім п'ять доларів за годину. Саме з того, що зробилося цікаво в той час, створилася нова технологія, називається Міді. Міді дала йому можливість заробляти більше, ніхто не знав, а він навчився дуже швидко. І Міді він заробляв десять доларів за годину. І тільки двоє людини розуміли міді. Він і Дон Во. Дон Во – це людина, до речі, яка спродюсувала від Eagles до всіх інших. І, і він почав заробляти більше грошей, 10 доларів за годину. Таким чином він почав виживати і вже зрозумів в той час, що почалося хіп-хоп. А хіп-хоп – це якась музика, яка спрацюється на міді. Тому всі хіп-хоп, всі, навіть латинські речі, які приходили через міді, всі приходили до нього. Він почав заробляти багато грошей і почав працювати дуже багато. Окей. Okay, so. And maybe the kind of the point is perhaps mm -hmm. when there's a change and MIDI was a very new technology. Drummers started not getting as much session work because you could use a drum machine with MIDI right. instead. Yes. When there's a change in the industry, it creates an opportunity. So while some drummers that I knew were complaining they didn't have as much work, I saw MIDI as an opportunity for me to start to work. Yeah. And so, yeah, skipping ahead again, this is a bit what's going on now. There's a lot of change. Correct. And with change, sometimes you don't see the opportunity, but ultimately there has to be opportunity. So basically when you see the technology uh, is coming, a new technology is, is coming in, that's an opportunity basically. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Even uh, if you don't know what it is at first, just keep looking, there'll be something. It's interesting that from MIDI, this new technology came in, вона, звичайно, дала йому можливість щось інше робити. І в той час якраз барабанщики замінялися в мірі барабанами, машинами називаються. І таким чином дуже багато нової музики з'явилося, бо нова технологія дала подих новій музиці. І якраз він почав тим займатися. Тому як продюсер він навчився це робити в студії, звичайно, як хіп-хоп. By the way, it's very interesting that you did that. I didn't know that you did hip-hop. But it's an interesting story. We'll talk privately about it. Okay, and then um, I understand, and Los Angeles was a very vibrant place at that time, I understand, as it is always. And then um, how about your big break? Like, how did you start actually getting on stage and getting demand so this, from, from bands and, and artists? Yeah, so this, from working in this MIDI room and having been an, an assistant or runner at the two studios prior, mm -hmm. this sort of beginning work, uh, I could have gone and never been recognized. That could have been pretty much all I did. Some of the people I worked with then went off and like became, they worked on a scoring stage the rest of their lives. Some of the people that I was coming up with, they just went like sort of that, around that level and found something comfortable and stayed. 
So that could have been, that could have been the end. So it's just a sheer luck, you're saying? Or no, the uh, because this is another key point. This is a um, in one's own career is that you things only happen. It's the most obvious thing to say, but things only happen when you make things, when you do things. Uh, so I had created a song demo with my roommate's band, another guy that I brought in at night, and the singer was secretly. Uh, using the demo that I was doing for free to shop himself for a solo deal. I thought mm -hmm. we were trying to get his band a deal so that I could produce his band. Mm -hmm. He was secretly using it for his own ends. So as soon as we finished the demo, he took off with it and disappeared. And I thought, well, that was a waste of time. <laughs> but about a year later, the singer from the rock band Poison heard the demo and started working with my roommate's brother writing songs. And so... Uh, as my roommate's brother is writing with Brett Michaels from Poison, he says, oh, and they wanted to record for real. They got past the demo stage. Uh, they said, he said, oh, well, hey, my, uh, my brother's a drummer, and his roommate uh, you know, made some great demos with us last year, and uh, uh, why don't we work with him? So Brett Michaels from Poison, then uh, at the time I was recording with my friend Rob, and Brett Michaels from Poison came to the two of us and said, yeah, okay, I'll give you guys a shot. He was making some songs with his girlfriend. And, uh, and so we started recording with, uh, and at the time, he was one of the largest, uh, he was fronting one of the largest rock bands in the world. We were doing yeah. huge business. And so for a two year period, as they were on tour and off of tour, I did pretty much uh, the lion's share of their studio work. Mm -hmm. I worked with, first I made his girlfriend's record with him, uh, and then Rob and I did, and then Rob and I made a song with him uh, for Stevie Nicks from mm -hmm. Fleetwood Mac. And then uh, I uh, mixed and did the studio tracks, uh, recorded the, uh, uh, studio tracks for his double live album, Poison's double live album. So, oh. I, so he, I'm forever indebted to to him for believing and giving me a huge break. Because yeah. at the same time, he was working with Bruce Fairburn, who was at the absolute peak of his career in Vancouver, yeah. Canada. So here's a guy working with the hottest rock producer in the world, and he's taking me under his wing and saying, "I like what you guys do. Let's go record." Interesting. I asked him if he had ever been a producer in the industry, and why he decided to be a producer. Цікава історія. У нього був румейт, тобто людина, з ким ти живеш коти, і він записав його демо. І це демо він захотів десь продати в якій записуючій компанії. Тобто записуюча компанія не називає то демо, але Брэд Майклс, це, це, це співак із групи Poison. Poison в той час була найпопулярна група в Америці. І, він почув це демо і сказав, хто ж був, хто записав це? І сказали йому, що це його румейт. І він підійшов до Тома і сказав, я хочу, щоб ти зі мною працював. І він почав працювати з Poison, потім почав працювати з Стіві Некс, це співачка з Клітвуд Мак. І таким чином почав записувати, і воно почало звучати дуже гарно. Звичайно, коли звучить гарно, результат очевидний, оцінку нам не треба там. So, I'm just saying, the actuality probably is just because you're probably good at it. And that's why Brad Michael saw what you saw. So you, your innate uh, ability to produce record that was probably your feeling like when you were listening to the records when you were a little boy, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely drawing on that. And, and I didn't know at the time, but what was happening in the studio mm. is that Rob and I, partially because we were young, but, uh, and we knew enough about what we were doing, we had enough experience, but we made Brett feel very comfortable. And I had been, when I was starting out and I was the runner in the studio, I would step into sessions or, or assist on a session for a day or two, and I would see sessions with so much tension and, uh, and the producers making everyone uncomfortable. And uh, I just thought, I don't want to do this. It was just instinctual. I was like, well, I want to make everyone comfortable. So I didn't know at the time, but that was, that was part of what, uh, what Brett really liked, is it was, I created a comfortable and safe place. So wouldn't you say that the... Uh one of the examples of, of a quality for the producer is just being uh, a diplomat, in a sense, in the studio. Yeah, yeah, well, that can be a challenge, too, because, it, uh, uh, yeah, it, uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, you can, a good producer 
makes it look like he or she in the middle of a session is almost doing nothing. Uh, so I've had engineers work, I bring people up under me, an apprentice, and sometimes I've seen them think, oh, that's easy what Tom does. <laughs> and they start to get a little uppity, you know, the, the new kids are like, ah, I could do that. He's getting all the glory. <laughs> and so uh, when I see that, sometimes I take them aside and explain what's going on yes. and tell them to be quiet. Or sometimes I do the opposite and I put them in the seat. Yeah, sure, you go ahead. Mm -hmm. You try. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's a challenge right there. Uh, цікаво, історію я пытаюсь, ну, і як uh, uh, працювати було з, з Брэд Майклс. Він, казав, він каже, що основна технологія в цьому була, що він дуже зробив атмосферу комфортабельну для артиста. Деякі продюсери працюють з артистом дуже погано, наприклад, вони їм кажуть, роблять дуже некомфортабельну не, 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 не основу і таким чином артист не може розкритися, записатися і не може написати пісню. Uh, основна з таких якостей, що там має, це дійсно є така дипломатія студії, тому артист розкривається. Бладська історія каже, що він брав якогось інженера працювати з ним, і інженер бачить, що там багато не робить. Якщо він багато не робить, це означає легко. І він каже, ну давай тут я спродюсую, нічого не вийшло. Тому дипломатія, я думаю, це, напевно, такі зроки у продюсерці. So I'm just saying, the problem with the, the relationships and the the good relationships with the artist and, and diplomacy is probably one of the main qualities of a producer. It, it, yeah. Now we've touched on the three key things. Number one is, is creating stuff, making things. Mm -hmm. That's how it circles around and comes mm -hmm. back. You have to make things. And, uh, and you've hit on number two, which is you have to be honest. And uh, because as time goes by, that's all, you know, it's all we have in the end is our word. Mm -hmm. And so you get a good reputation by being honest. And then, uh, and number three, uh, I learned the hard way, it's very important to discern as quickly as you can who is who. Mm -hmm. For instance, in that very beginning, which led to Brett Michaels, my roommate was the greatest person on the planet. Mm -hmm. He was a drummer, and so I recorded his band because he was so great. But unbeknownst to me, I didn't take the time to figure out that the singer was a liar. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in, in, in essence, I wasted my time on the demo, but it came back around it, it, with Brett Michaels. But... As time goes on, that's that's the number three thing. You have to figure out who's who. Who who can you give your trust to, and uh, always be honest yourself. And then going backwards, the first thing, create. He says that three main characteristics for a producer are that you have to do something to make something come out. You have to work on it. So the idea is number one. Number two, it's not like that. So you have to be a diplomat and understand how to work. And number three, to understand who is who. So. Ми ніколи не знаємо, кому, коли ми бачимо людей перший раз, але в кінці кінців розуміти, що із-за цих людей ми щось робимо. Тобто може таке вийти, що та людина, яка тебе обманула, в кінці кінців приведе людину, з ким ти будеш працювати. Тому це треба все розуміти. So it's just very tricky business. And what we talk about, it applies really to anything that you want it to. It could be for writing songs, it could be for producing. These are sort of these are rules that, that will work in uh, over and over again in, in many different ways. Yeah, він каже, що ці правила будуть працювати і для тих, хто пише пісні, і для артистів, бо воно працює. Ну, дійсно працює, і це навчився. All right, so I have another question. Um, something that's on my chest. <laughs> Beck and uh, the song Loser. Again, it's one of the, to me, it's one of the re like revolutionary ideas of the sound, how it was created. I don't know how it was created, but it's brilliant and genius. And uh, I think that's probably also why it was widely successful single. And uh, that was the first song that uh, that I produced with my friends that went, uh, and I also put it out on my record label as well, but it was the first song that I was instrumental in creating that went right around the world, and uh, which was a, a really a, amazing phenomenon to see. But uh, Back to Loser, це був його перший, uh, перший запис, який пішов по всьому світі, який він, він спродюсував сам. Uh, well, I have a question about meeting Beck. How did you meet Beck, and how did you recognize the talent in Beck and, and working with him? Yeah, it still goes back to the, still the very beginning of that MIDI room. One day I got sent a uh, hip-hop uh, song demo for Virgin, an act called The College Boys that never went anywhere. And, uh, and they're from Houston, and they came in with this white kid called Carl Stevenson, who uh, was this sort of like uh, savant genius, uh, mm -hmm. musical genius, and electronic, he 
could build things from scratch. Uh, he could program. And he was at the very beginning of hip hop, and he was the first white guy I met that could make real, real beats. And uh, so I was completely, uh, and he was uh, like a year younger than me. We were like, we were peers. And so he and I started working together, uh, and uh, uh, immediately we clicked. And uh, we went out to a coffee house one night, to a folk coffee house. And he said, Tom, what do you think about doing hip hop and folk? I said, that's a great idea. He mm -hmm. said, okay, we do it together. Because you know how to record bands, I'll make some beats, and uh, we'll put the two together. And uh, and he said, and the, the woman singing, she was like a Joan Baez knockoff on the stage. She's like, I met her a couple weeks ago, what do you think of her? I said, that's fine, let's try it as an experiment. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he tried one day to record her, and she got really upset. He thought that he was destroying her songs. So I said, <laughs> of course. Oh, well, I said, yeah. <laughs> so a year later, I saw Beck in a coffee house, and I was like, ah. I called Carl and I said, I found the guy. I found the guy to do the hip hop folk thing. I saw him in a coffee house. No one was paying attention. I was in the back of the room. Everybody was talking. Between bands, he got on the stage, like a rope for a guitar strap, and he's playing. He's got a harmonica. He's like sort of Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan and, and one. And this little kid, and he's like 20 years old, and he plays a song. And I, I just see the whole thing. I'm like, oh, this is going to work perfectly. So I go up afterwards, but knowing how upset the woman had been the year prior, I say, hey, what do you think? You know, we really changed your songs, flipped things around backwards, had distortion, blow it up. Nita smiled and said, oh, that sounds great. And so we went uh, to Carl's house. I said, Carl, I found the guy. He'd forgotten about the idea. He's like, oh, okay. And so I said, we made a date. And I took back over to Carl's house. And in six and a half hours, we made Loser from scratch. And uh, yeah, that's, Amazing. that's how Amazing. it came to be. Amazing. Well, it's one of my favorites. So um, how simple, the best, like the best things in the world are very simple. Я запитався, як він зустрів так, як прийшла ідея з пісні Loser. І взагалі саунд, який я дуже люблю цей сам. Він зустрів такого товариша, називається Карл, який працював на міді, та як Том. Він робив біт в той час. Біт це було дуже нове в той час, ніхто цього не робив через міді. І Карл сказав тому ідею. Каже, давай зробимо якийсь проект, де буде фольклорна музика з хіп-хопом разом. Такого ще не було тоді. І вони пішли в кафе, та до чай, і там якісь музиканти грають. І він запитався, давай, може, з цією дівчиною зробимо такий проєкт. Вони запросили її в студію і показали, як там поставити драмбіт до, до фольклорної музики. І вона дуже образилася і вийшла, сказала, як ви можете таке робити до моєї музики, і не вийшло все. Потім Том пішов в кофі гаус сам і подивився, Грає якийсь на гітарі людина з, гармон... з гармошкою таку фольклорну музику. Підійшов до нього і каже, слухайте, а може от у мене є ідея, ми можемо зробити дуже таке дивне, дивний саунд, дуже кул. Cool. Йдемо в студію. Вони зайшли в студію, він поставив там дисторшн на його вокал, поставив біт, а так сказав, о, мені це дуже подобається. І таким чином він, він позвонив Карлу. Карл каже, все, давай зробимо пісню. Вони зробили одну з пісні, що так, і вони всі написали. І 36 годин в студії зробилася пісня «Лузер», яка в той час була єдина пісня до цих пір, до речі, яка незалежно від, від, від записуючої компанії стала в хітах у всьому світі. І навіть що цей пісень був вже 94, це було 20 років тому, але є декілька речей, які релевантні зараз, навіть якщо це дуже старий історія. Так, це в цьому сенсі. One was the technology at that point had just arrived at the point where we could record that. Mm -hmm. Carl was renting a room in an old dilapidated Spanish mansion mm -hmm. uh, in Hollywood from his manager. And so we were able to record that song in a house mm -hmm. with, because, we, because of the, that new, new to digital technology was allowing that, mm -hmm. and, uh, where we would have had to have been in a formal studio before. And the, uh, and the other thing about that song, which is relevant to today, much the same, is that was made completely outside the system. There was no manager, there was no publisher, there was no record label, there was nothing. We made it out of a pure idea and a pure passion, and it found its way uh, the same way today. It's different technology, but it's still technology-based. The way something can get on YouTube and go crazy just when you thought mm -hmm. you were gonna show it to five friends and it goes mm -hmm. off, that's, that's, that's the magic and, and the sort of power of music. And Excellent. that's where even a 20-year-old story is, it's, you know, same thing could happen it's today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Застаріло і 20 років, але все рівно це було 94-й рік, і в 94-му році технологія міді тільки починалася. І е, таким чином вони це могли зробити, щоб був звук такий. 
І також це воно має відношення до сьогоднішнього дня, тому що у нас зараз також нова технологія, називається інтернет, YouTube. Тоді, в той час, у них не було ні менеджера, ні родні записуючих компаній, нікого. Вони все самі зробили, і пісня сама знайшла свого слухача через нову технологію. Зараз це таке саме відбувається на YouTube. Зараз не потрібно мати ні менеджера, ні записуючих компаній, якщо є якась пісня, яка знаходить свого слухача. Навіть більше, швидше. I think YouTube is very much similar to new technology delivery or distribution. Uh, this is something that I want to ask you later on. Great. Uh, the question I have now, um, since back you went uh, with working with a lot of interesting people, including uh, Moby, Gwen Stefani, Foo Fighters. Uh, Foo Fighters that was, was that around that time. Yeah. Was the excuse me? The, around that time was the time that we, because the I had my own label, and because this had been a. Uh, an artistically impacting record and album and signing. It had been a big industry buzz. And at this point, I was starting to get known in the industry. And, and so I was starting to get offered work. And yes, that's when it was starting to become real. I understand. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a single back uh, loser. Звичайно, всі почали бачити в індустрії Тома як один з основних продюсерів у світі. Тому і за цього до нього підійшли великі проекти. So that's why so we got offered from Foo Fighters. I guess. Uh, yeah, shortly thereafter, yeah. Yeah. Then Moby, uh, very interesting project, Moby, I want to ask you that. Then Gwen Stefani, then you have uh, Burnside, very interesting project. In fact, uh, one of, recently, I, I discovered very interesting project, Elbow. Uh, uh, yeah. Very interesting artistic project. English. And then, of course, James Blunt. Uh, one thing I want to ask about uh, Moby. Uh, Moby was a very interesting artist and a different artist at that time. Because uh, the top 40 did, didn't sound like Moby. And uh, how a record company would put a record on the radio that doesn't sound like a radio, right? And how Moby, who was, I, I understand, he was a DJ, uh, came with a sound. And how, in, in what capacity you started to work with him? Uh, and Moby contacted me, uh, and I wasn't sure why. Uh, also, the uh just prior to that in los angeles the most influential at the time new music radio station was k-rock the most influential maybe in america and uh they've been playing fat boy slim and he had a uh a song with like an old uh, gospel vocal in it so he touched on this idea of uh of club music and blues uh moby uh had heard the rl burnside record that you mm -hmm. mentioned that i produced and co-wrote with him uh, with Arl Burnside. Moby heard this, and that's why he sent me some stuff from his play album I as see. he was making it. And I thought, why is Moby sending me music? And as soon as they sent it to me, they sent four or five songs with blues samples. And I was like, oh, he heard my blues project, and he's been inspired to make his own. I and see. so he's asking me to collaborate on it. That's that's how Moby began. I see, interesting. I was asking him, how did Moby start? Moby sent to him. He didn't know why he sent Moby to him. Uh, була така причина, він, він зробив проект uh, з Ел Бернсайд, це блюз, але такі uh, із барабанами, які зроблені на, на, на машині, тобто нереальні барабани, тобто блюз, але, але технології. І в той час це було дуже цікаво. І така була uh, радіо в Лос-Анджелесі K-Rock, той час, що грала Fatboy Slim. Fatboy Slim дуже була неординарна музика, яка не йде на основні радіо. І за цього Мобі до нього подзвонив, щоб поставити на ту радіо. І він почув той альбом, що там зробили, і каже, я тобі хочу поставити свою музику. Він послухав Мобі музику, сказав, ага, ось що, скопіював від мене, окей. І почав з ним співпрацювати. Uh, so I understand that Moby record became his breakthrough record, and actually not just his breakthrough record, it kind of changed the industry a little bit. What do you, what do the, you think about uh, At the time, K-Rock, the most influential station, was playing a lot of guitar-based stuff. Mm. And so uh, the record company, once they heard that uh, Rob and I were going to be involved in working with Moby, they uh, they brought one other song besides the blues song. So they brought uh, a song called Southside, simply because it had electric guitar and labeled thought, oh, radio plays electric guitar. <laughs> and uh, so uh, the A&R brought that, and I said, sure, I'll work on this one too. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's where we came up with the plan. I said, it should, and I proposed to Moby, it should have maybe, uh, let's put some live drums on it, first of all, and then uh, let's put some female vocals in the chorus, because it was very high for Moby to sing mm -hmm. the chorus. And that led to then bringing Gwen Stefani in on the song. Mm -hmm. uh, and the 
record, the A&R person, was never felt confident that what we had created, and we were Moby, Rob, myself, Gwen, we were all very happy with what we'd done with the song. Mm -hmm. We thought we'd done the most that could be done to it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the A&R was never confident enough to take it back to his boss who had told him to make it so. And uh, I said, look, don't worry. It's not, we've optimized the song Southside. It's as good as it can be. And plus, it's gonna be one of these blues songs that's gonna break Moby on this play record like how it's worked for Fatboy Slim. That's on K-Rock. Like, so I had this discussion with him, disagreeing, and said, no, 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 the blues songs. And sure enough, when Play came out, it broke on a blues song, and the South Side single came much later, and worked, yes. great, and worked great. That's an interesting story. I asked him, how did Snoopy do it? He started to do it so that he took radio, because it was very popular music, and it actually changed how the radio works with Snoopy. And it appears, Моби йому переслав ще одну пісню, називається «Southside». «Southside» там мала електричну гітару. І, звичайно, радіо подумало, ну, є електрична гітара, це можна вже на радіо, на рок-радіо показувати. І сказали, давайте зробимо цю пісню як основний сингл, основну пісню, що буде робити Моби. І він запросив Гвен Стефані, бо пісня була дуже висока, Моби хотів сам співати, він сказав, ну, так не піде. З Гвен Стефані вона це заспіває. Запросив Гвен Стефані, вона заспівала, зробила цю пісню. Але, насправді, що зробив цей альбом, Молбі, називається Play, до речі, Молбі. І це якраз у ті пісні, які він робив з блузу, саундом, коли гітара з барабанами грає. А цей сингл я пішов, направду, пізніше. Так воно і було. Дуже цікаво. 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 Дуже but I also had to be true to the music. It was a very difficult situation. Yeah. And he kept calling into the studio and saying, what's going on? And I was telling him, well, you know, this is, this is all we can do. And these calls kept coming and Moby was starting to see. Mm -hmm. uh, we always make the studio a safe zone. So, uh, but Moby was starting to sense from these phone calls, like, hey, what's going on? And so I told him finally, when it had gone, gone as far as it could, I said, well, they keep asking us to change the song more. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm explaining to them that we've made the song the best that the song could be. Yeah. And if we want, if you want to work more, we should find another song to work on. And uh, and Moby said, "Yeah, I absolutely agree." I thought the song. Moby said, "I thought the song was done when you got it, and then what you guys have done is taken it to a whole other place. I couldn't be happier." Uh, so, uh, uh, and he said something that was a really astute quote because at that point, Moby had the most he had sold was one hundred thousand, mm -hmm. and uh, he said, "Hey, I'd love to sell three million records, which is what they want, mm -hmm. albums, but." I can't change who I am to do that. Mm -hmm. And this is this is true to me, so this has to be it. And he walked in the other room and called his manager and got out of the contract to change labels. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Можна зробити цю пісню так, щоб для раді, взагалі альбом, щоб ці всі пісні, як з Бен Стефані. Ну і, звичайно, Том, він не хотів це робити. Він відчував, що воно звучить оригінально і дуже цікаво. І Мобі це відчув, також запитався. І він з Томом погодився, що треба так робити. І вони вийшли із записуючого контракту і самі знову це зробили. Знову ж таки, екземпляр того, що успіх є чесності. Uh, well, great. Uh, and, the, and the last thing uh, about that long story, yes, it is long story. Yes, <laughs> is uh, the record comes out and it doesn't sell three million. Mm -hmm. It sells about ten million worldwide. Oh wow! And uh, and the second half of those sales are propelled mm -hmm. by the Gwen Stefani track Southside. Mm -hmm. And the next year we go to the Grammys, and it came out on a different label. It came out at the time the brand new V two Richard yes, Branson new label. Yeah. They picked it up. And the next year we go to the Grammy party, one of the Grammy parties after the Grammys, and. Moby had won a Grammy, he had been up for four or five Grammys that year. It was a big deal. And who do I see at the party? But my old friend Tom, who had pushed it too far and lost the deal. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, I'm standing there with Moby, and I say, Tom, I'm, you know, I told you the blues song. <laughs> and he said, I know, I know, my boss. He said, and then album sold 10 million in the world. And when he came to цей альбом взяв 5 Грэмі, і вони взяли 5 Грэмі, і він зустрічає цього іншого Тома, той, що стоїть з записуючою компанією, коли говорив, що треба робити рок-музику з цього всього. І Том каже, ну, я ж тобі казав, треба було зробити з цього. Ну, от. Тобто, тепер ми маємо історію, і нарратив. І поїнт цього, 
uh, it's not from, I already know my story. I, I don't, I don't tell it very often, but the point of it is, is that I still believe that, that this can, anybody can do something. The situations change in life, but yeah. you can always do something. So now we have a story, my story, which is of a, a kid who drops out of university with a dream to record and no real ability. Uh, and now suddenly, uh, I'm in the middle of, you know, accidentally shipping the course of a, of a 10 million selling album from one label to another, again, by being honest and, with, and just telling people what, what the truth is. And so that distance from 21-year-old kid dropping out of university to that point in a few years, it's, uh, uh, to me, that was about as crazy as, yes. crazy as it could get. I said that this is such a rock, because I'm honest. That means he, from a little bit of a village, even if he was in college at the end, щось там виживав в Лос-Анджелесі, тут він вже продає 10 мільйонів альбомів, і в нього була велика популярність. Тобто для нього це означало вчену, що він це робив чесно, тому воно це здійснилося. І в цьому є його суть життя. So I have a question now about the uh, very important artist and very important project that uh, everybody knows around the world. And I think it's uh, in the time when music started to be very studio-oriented, digital, and uh, overproduced, top 40. Uh, and then you come up with something very, very different. And I don't think, if I was a record company executive, I would doubt that project because mm. the demand is quite different. What I know from my sales, right? So how would you, well, well first of all, how do you recognize the talent in James Blunt when you met him? Uh, he he just gotten he'd gone to Austin, Texas that year. He dropped out of the military. I didn't I'd never heard of him. But he went to South by Southwest and he played in like in an alleyway with an acoustic guitar. And Linda Perry, the singer from Four Non Blondes, who had just recently at that time written with Christina Aguilera and Pink, uh, she picked him up and she saw a talent in him. And uh, but she didn't even have a record company, it was just her and her manager. They called themselves a record company, but they were just beginning. And uh, but I'd done the same when it was just me and my friends when I'd signed back, so to my label, so I understood that idea of, of just passion and doing something from the street. And uh, so after South by Southwest, they sent me five demos, and uh, Wiseman was on that, Your Beautiful was on it, Goodbye My Lover, and uh, I don't remember the other two, but the, there's two more that are on Back to Bedlam. And, uh, uh, and the demos were all over the place. One was like this, because he'd done them with all different people, different songwriters. It was, it was uh, kind of in a shambles, but, uh, uh, there was something that I liked about it. So they said, he's coming to Los Angeles, will you take a meeting? And I said, right. yeah, yeah. And as soon as he walked in the room, I'd never even seen a photograph of him. I'd only heard his voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, he walked in the room, I thought, oh, that must be him. And I looked in his eyes, it was like a, like something out of a, 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 a date or something. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, we can make a record together. This will mm -hmm. be good. And later I told him that story. I said, when you walked in the room, that restaurant, the first time in Los Angeles, I said, oh, yeah, I knew. He's like, yeah, I saw you, and you were the last producer I met. And I, I saw you, I was like, oh, phew, because he said, I hadn't met anyone I, I, I connected with. They're all no. people the label wanted me to work with, but then I saw you, I was like, yeah, okay, I'll do it with him. Цікаво, що він почув Джеймс Блант перший раз через Лінда Перрі. Лінда Перрі, до речі, вона дуже відома композиторша. Вона також була в групі, називається Four Non Blondes в Сан-Франциско. І Линда Перрі йому сказала, що от мене є якась людина з Лондона невідома, вона приїхала в Тексас і виступає тут на вулиці, на гітарі, мені щось подобалося, я не знаю, може ти щось з нею можеш зробити. Тому тобто послухав пару демо, одна з тих пісень була «Your Beautiful» демонстрація, і він сказав так, мені цікаво з ним познайомитися. Він приїхав в Лос-Анджелес, побачив Джеймс Блан, подивився, це так, на, 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 на побачення з дівчиною, побачив so you had a love at first, at first sight then? Uh, so to speak. So to speak, yes. And we, uh, we set out to make the record, and Linda Perry didn't have a company behind her. Yeah. But she was willing to, with the money she'd made from songwriting, mm -hmm. apparently, she was willing to bankroll the recording of this yeah. record because she believed in it. And so I thought, well, if she's crazy enough to bankroll it by herself, then maybe I'm crazy enough to make it. And, and we <laughs> made it. And the whole time she thought it was going to go through uh, Atlantic. And uh, in the end, Atlantic changed and consolidated labels. 
excuse me, and uh, and so it wasn't able to go through there. Yeah. It sat in New York, and they said, okay, we're going to pick it up. Atlantic New York says, we'll have it. And then they go, no, actually, we can't keep it. And so they're letting most of their artists go. So it sat there finished for months, and it looked like it was never going to come out. And he played a showcase in London, and the Atlantic in the UK, excuse me, somewhat reluctantly decided to put it out. It's like, oh, we'll give it a try. Nobody thought. It was, it was a record that, uh, it was a project that was singing, it was a man singing to a woman, that album, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But the, I felt good producing it because uh, he was signed to two ladies, Linda and her, and her uh, management partner, yeah. Katrina. So I thought, well, good, we're making a record that's a man singing to a woman, and the, the people that are in charge of it afterwards mm -hmm. are women, so this is good. But then they couldn't, and they were going to give it to an, the only other woman in the business with real power was Sylvia Rome, yeah. and they were going to give it to her. So I was like, okay, this is good. But then Sylvia changed jobs and uh, suddenly was out of it. So now you've got this album, songs like Goodbye My Lover and You're Beautiful. They're singing, a man singing to a woman, and it's with all these guys in New York, and they're like, well, <laughs> I don't know, I don't like it. The, they want yeah, to listen to ACDC or something. It was, like, it was literally on the on the desk mm -hmm. of the guy who had signed and championed Kid Rock. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Jason Flom. So, and he, to his credit, even wanted to put the record out. Even though he's the guy that did Kid Rock, he still thought, well, there's something about this. I want to do it. But then it, it uh, so it almost never came out. Wow. Uh, так би так як Линда Перри підписала Джеймс Блант, і хотіли, щоб потом робив, потом подивився, що якщо вона ненормально, щоб підписати такого невідомого, він теж буде ненормальний, щоб в нього повірити. І вони почали працювати разом. А, тут одна така була річ, значить, альбом, ми всі думали, що альбом буде, як мужчина співає для жінки альбом. І таким чином він думав, що якщо той, хто робить альбом, зараз це Линда, і її партнерша по бізнесу Катріна, дві жінки, тоді має сенс. Коли вони почали думати про дистрибуцію альбому, вони поїхали в Нью-Йорк до Atlantic Records і виявляється, всі чоловіки в Atlantic Records не розуміли альбом, бо це вони ж не жінки, вони відчувають, що тут їм співають таке. І, звичайно, альбом майже не вийшов. І дуже випадково так, що в Лондоні він виступав на концерті маленькому, підійшли Atlantic London і сказали, нам цікаво. І за це зробився великий альбом. So, and to this day is basically one of the biggest albums sold in the century. Yeah. I understand it, right? Yeah, worldwide, yeah. Worldwide. And how many records were sold? Oh, I, more than 12 million. 12 hours. million. Yeah. Amazing. And then the song downloads and the ringtones. Oh, so, yeah. It's a, it's a album, it's a real, 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 Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, really the, yeah. the Guinness has made a report that it's the most popular album in the world. All right, well, this is a very interesting story you have, uh, Mr. Rothrock. <laughs> I have another question, a very different one, that is going to be interesting for um, potential producers and existing producers that's here or, or our listeners and viewers. Sure. Uh, how do you recognize a talent? For example, you walk in the street and you say, you know, I like this guy singing on the corner, and I know this is something different, and I recognize in this, in this guy a talent, a voice, a songwriting, something that doesn't exist, and yet it's something that talks to you. Well, how do you approach this project? Like, how do you start recognizing a talent overall? Well, I think you've, I think you've already said it. That you well, see something you. that uh, <laughs> you see something that you just know you have to, you have to work with. Uh, that could be an idea for a song. You could, you know hear a story that somebody tells and you just have an idea for a song. You could see somebody playing an instrument and say, oh, yeah. I want to record them. You could invite them to add a solo. Maybe it's a violinist and you, add, you just have them add a solo on a song. It could be the inspiration and then the collaborative uh, mm -hmm. attraction can, ha can happen anywhere. And it could, or it could be an artist that you want to develop and, uh, and help them launch their career. But it always comes from that funny little <laughs> feeling. Uh, I think everybody in the room at some point heard a song and got a, a special feeling from the music. and. It's as simple as uh, that's you go with that, and uh, that doesn't change. And that's the the challenge uh, for uh, somebody working privately in the mm -hmm. business or somebody working publicly in entertainment. The challenge remains the same because, you know, some of these stories that I tell, they have crazy things that happen in them. And so, and amongst that craziness, it, you stay connected. The yeah. challenge is to stay connected to that original thing, like when you were a kid or the first time you heard a song and you, you couldn't believe what you were hearing. You have to stay connected to that because that's what guides you. Uh, but that's a huge challenge. 
It's sort of like a DJ that drinks a lot and sees how much they can drink while they still DJ well. You know, it's like you've got one thing you have to do that's very delicate and something else that's really noisy. Tak to znaczy, że pewne rzeczy były tak ciekawe, więc to, to było wszystko, co mnie wszystko zaznaczyło, zwyczajnie, więc kiedy mnie pytał, tak, co ty wyczuwasz, ty ludzie, ty wyczuwasz, że ty wiesz, co trzeba zrobić, to to co jest emocjonalne liczne, na jakim ty myślisz, że trzeba zrobić taką jakąś muzykę, jakiś projekt. Uh, і відчувати людей, тобто, коли ми робимо якийсь проєкт, це звичайно ми робимо для людей. Тому відчувати людей одне з основних речей, як, наприклад, DJ, коли він бачить, скільки людей п'ють, uh, чи коктейлі якісь, коли він робить DJ, він більше той DJ робить. Тобто відчувати публіку, це, напевно, одна з основних речей. So I think we're probably feeling the, uh, the audience is probably one of the main aspects of producing in order to understand uh, the, the, why doing this? The producer, in a sense, represents the audience, yes. the objectivity. Uh, when you're when you're in the middle of making a song or, or working on a project, yeah. you represent the audience. But it's also important to not guess or try an audience or try to think what somebody else would like. You have to do what you like. Yeah. Uh, and if you liked popular records when you were growing up, uh, or classic records then you can always trust your own instinct because you know I like Sgt. Pepper's as you know so if I if I get a good feeling like I get when I listen to Sgt. Pepper's I know I'm on the right track it's not uh, uh, yeah I, a, lot, a lot of what you do when you have to make these decisions on your own and again it could be in any role within mm -hmm. entertainment or in life and you have to make these decisions on your own you the first thing you have to develop is that trust in yourself and when you have the trust in yourself other people will see that and then uh, and they, they'll trust you to help them yeah, thank you uh, the challenge what ever робити музику ту, що тобі подобається. Не питатися людей, що вам подобається, робити для них. А то, що для себе подобається. Ну так, як, наприклад, йому подобається Сержант Пеппер, то, звичайно, він робить таке, що йому подобається. І, напевно, людям, хто подобається Сержант Пеппер, буде подобатися його музика. А, таким чином розвивається а, і, і цікава ідея. І саме основне в цьому плані – це віра в себе. Якщо ти віриш в себе, то, звичайно, люди повірять в тебе також. А, дуже логічно. So, um... Something technical I want to ask you, that I'm sure that uh, people are going to ask you as well. What kind of equipment do you use normally? Let's, so let's say the technology always changes. Right? Yeah. And uh, uh, they use, well, 30 years ago, everything was analog. Huge tapes, 24 inch, I mean, 24 inch, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah, two. Uh, the two inch tape with, with the 24 tracks. Right. Uh, the music sounded one way, right? Now you mentioned in the MIDI, the MIDI sounds with a different sound of it because it's digital. Now we have Pro Tools, we have Cubase, we have Logic, and so on and so forth. We have uh, Tractor software, a lot of so a lot of softwares now. How does that affect the music creation per se, a music, uh, a music sound or a music uh, delivery when you produce now compared to let's say 20 years ago? Uh, I've always, while learning the tradition of recording, I always enjoyed using the latest technology, and at the time MIDI was the latest thing, and that really helped me. But at the same time, I like to go backwards and learn how the classic things I'd heard were recorded. Mm -hmm. So I've always incorporated the newest with the oldest. And I learned over time that that's sort of what, that's really what the bands I liked, like the Beatles or Pink Floyd, they were doing that as well. Mm -hmm. They were working in a traditional setting, but they were also looking for the newest thing that's to come out that could give them an edge or a different sound, something somebody hadn't quite heard yet. And now, it's, uh, it's a great time because everybody can have a laptop. And uh, my laptop, is more powerful uh, in my briefcase than some of the million dollar studios I started out in. And uh, so that's amazing. But then getting back to the academy, that's what's important about a forum for people to come together and share ideas. Because it's great to have technology and it's great to have powerful equipment at your fingertips, but when the magic really happens is when you have an exchange with another person. And that becomes the tool for capturing the exchange. Yeah, that's a great answer. Звичайно, uh, Shavin, по-іншому робить музику, скажімо, сьогодні, ніж вчора, але він робив той, той самий принцип. Він робив комбінацію сьогоднішнього дня з щось старим. Наприклад, він, він слухає записи 20 років, 40 років назад, а технологія сьогоднішня. В комбінації тих він завжди так і робив, робив цей новий саунд. Він завжди хоче зробити щось нове в звуці, що люди ще не чули, тому воно буде цікаво. Пінк Флойд і всі інші, вони також так робили, також Бітлз, абсолютно правильно, згідно з Томом. Ще цікавенько, що в цій академії якраз буде така платформа, що він бачить, що якраз оця технологія дається всім однаково, 
А от ще основне буде це ідея людей, які будуть користуватися цією технологією в колаборації з іншими. І щось буде зовсім інакше. Це, це напевно, саме цікаве. All right, uh, we're going something to the future a little bit. Okay. Uh, I understand that your success was based on, um, on, on certain technology, let's say. The media you, you mentioned, uh, then obviously the sound of rock music, the, the sound of Moby, the James Blunt, uh, and that's basically going 90s, the beginning of this century. Uh, it's a little bit different now, what, what we're experiencing. As I see it, uh, yeah. we have Napster, we have digital sound. Uh, there is no records per se, right? Um, so people can't can't feel the product of the music, yeah. Uh, but they can hear the sound of music coming from internet, YouTube, and so on. But or they in, don't in a shop, the, the correct? Record. Yeah. But they don't have the uh, ability to buy it and feel it. So how do you see the future of an artist? So let's say if I'm an artist and you're a producer, what would be an advice for an artist uh, to see his future, how it's going to be delivered to the public, and how he would be thinking of himself as an artist in that sense? Well, there's two, there's two facets to it. There's what's going on right now in everyone's life uh, in the uh, sort of digital social media world. Mm -hmm. And uh, everyone, uh, nearly everyone I know is involved in that uh, in one way or another. And so as an artist, that comes into play. This sort of artificial cyber world where you can make noise and try to get noticed. Uh, that's one aspect. And the other aspect of what's going on, of course, is the old-fashioned idea of people coming together in one place. And that, I think, is a good place to put your emphasis. So if you're starting to make music now, mm -hmm. if you want to be an artist, uh, say a performer, it, that's where I would put my energy into uh, a community, uh, audience, connecting with people in person first, and then social media after. And uh, it's an interesting time. Everything right now, it's, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's, it's, uh, it's very fragile right now. I mean, there's, uh, people are being rewarded for acting up. Uh, so, right? So just recently, uh, Diplo is working with Skrillex, right? Electronic yes. guys. He goes on the internet and makes fun of Taylor Swift. And yes. so I see it, he gets a lot of attention for that. Correct. That's not really the best behavior. And then ironically, he, as he's doing this, he's just finishing a new Justin Bieber single. So maybe if you're a DJ and you're, you know, and you're working with Justin Bieber, who is a pop artist who gets, gets made a lot of fun of, maybe you ought to understand that you, maybe you shouldn't also be adding that and going and making fun of another pop artist. And then to be rewarded for that. So this is, the, this is sort of the, the social media and reality TV world that has evolved to this on one side. I think that's not really healthy, and I don't think it's really good to put a lot of energy into that. Like, much better to work on connecting with people. Like the cafe we were in last night with right. the amazing DJ and those people around there that all knew each other. Yeah. That's, that's, I think, that for to start, that's a great start. I agree with this. I think uh, there's something in this world that's changing for sure. And uh, the social media is a new culture in the sense that uh, people don't know how to behave well. And I think the ethics of that is not yet in place, and I think that's exactly what you're referring to. Ми розмовляємо, як зараз артист може себе побачити в майбутньому, бо так як це не 90-ті роки, і навіть не 2000-ті, це вже трошки інший час, і технологія інша. І Том каже так, дійсно, соціальні медіа, такі як Facebook, ВКонтакті і так далі, воно робить зовсім інший метод, як артист себе відчуває. І є другий аспект, це є ті люди, з ким ти порозумієшся. Тобто ті люди, хто тебе розвиває, тобто це ком'юніті, з ким ти розвиваєшся, маєш свій концерт, чи маєш е, е, у себе вдома, чи, чи виступаєш для них. Він каже, дуже цікава історія, наприклад, такі діджі називаються Дубо з Голландії. І вони зробили проект із, із Skrillex е, нещодавно, де вони на, на соціальній мідії дуже багато розмовляли про Taylor Swift, яка вона погана. І в той же час вони зробили сингл з Justin Bieber. Uh, тобто, культурно це означає дуже негарно зроблено. Тобто, вони використали соціальне медіа для того, щоб зробити той сингл для Джастин uh, Бібер. Uh, тут є трошки є конфлікт, що відбувається зараз. Тобто, люди не знають, як поводитися uh, в соціальній медіа і той самий час мати своє суспільство, сво своїх слухачів. Хто такі свої слухачі? Uh, то, що він каже, що ми вчора були в кафе, називається «Гніздо». 
і е, нам дуже сподобалось, і, е, тому що там люди однодумці. Однодумці, вони відчувають один одного в музиці, і їм цікаво розвиватися разом. І це якраз аудиторія, і де ти можеш бути артистом. І це, напевно, він думає, що це майбутнє. So, have you been working on something that um, uh, incorporates this kind of idea of a, of a community rather or than uh, just being in the studio and just, just working with technology? Sort mm. of uh, like what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, in my own life? In your own life. Yeah, yes. yeah. I have for since 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, I began a uh, as my own experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's great to give advice uh, over the years from time to time, but then eventually you have to uh, take your own advice. Exactly. And, and, uh, so yeah, in 2011 I started uh, a, uh, a, uh, a community called Fuzzyland in mm -hmm. Los Angeles and uh, where people meet and uh, I've made my own electronic music and I play other people's electronic music and I incorporate live musicians that I've worked with throughout the years in the mm -hmm. studio uh, to perform uh, while I DJ and uh, to me that's been incredibly rewarding uh, bringing people together we do it in, we do it outside in nature it's our own festival it's mm -hmm. private and uh, and from there I've been experimenting in community building and from there people have met each other there that didn't know each other before and they're off doing things and uh, uh, and that's where I'm seeing a really positive thing in social mm -hmm. media because mm -hmm. I look on Facebook and they're all interacting and doing things and creating things and people are starting to build stuff for the community now mm -hmm. uh, on their own. Initially, uh, I built with a few friends, we built the uh, structure to have the, uh, have the events and now people are contributing and doing their own thing and, mm -hmm. and really making it their own. So, so yeah, that's been my, my foray into, uh, into what I'm talking about and it, it absolutely, uh, absolutely can be done. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen that. I've been there. <laughs> Uh, він каже там, що uh, дійсно, що треба, ти даєш багато порад в житті, але треба показати, що такі поради та, та, в житті. І він таке зробив. Він зробив такий маленький фестиваль у себе вдома uh, в Лос-Анджелесі, в лісі, де uh, збудував будиночок на, на деревах. І на тих деревах він робить такі діджеї, де, де він запрошує ще якихось діджеї з, з живими музикантами, з деревальщиками. І де вони просто всі розробляють нове ком'юніті креативних людей. І коли ці креативні люди потім збираються, у них йде синтез, і нові ідеї з'являються. І ці нові ідеї з'являються, і вже є більше людей роблять якийсь проект. І це робиться для того, щоб створити новий соціальний продукт. І цей новий соціальний продукт, він потім покаже, що у Фейсбуці вони розмовляють нові ідеї, розвиваються, і це вже є і бізнес, і це вже є артист. Uh, so, so, so wouldn't you say that the, uh, the contemporary artist, let's say, as of, as of today and uh, looking forward, mm. it's a community artist? Yeah, that's, I think you, yeah, absolutely, you must begin within your community and, and build, community, out, yes. build out from there. Yeah. yeah. So that's probably, and, and as far as Ukraine goes, um, mm. the community uh, of, of an artist, how would you develop, like, what would your advice be? Uh, how would an artist, a talent, let's say a talent comes here and then he, he becomes an artist, how would he develop outside of this academy a community? Uh, he or she, the, uh, uh, well, I, you know, at any given point in time, you have to look around and that landscape will change all the time. Uh, you know, there could be the cafe we were at last night could be a place for somebody to go and start something. You could go there and talk to the owner and say, I, I propose this, I'm going to bring my friends, we're all going to come and have a good time, we're going to perform, we're going to do poetry with somebody playing a, a guitar in the background. Whatever it is, you can just go and propose, but that landscape will change. The main thing is doing something, mm -hmm. doing something publicly. Uh, you know, if there's a place where somebody can go busk, they can busk. There's many ways to do it. You have to find what you can do at that given time, and it's a constantly changing landscape. But it is again the perfect uh, opportunity to d just do something and uh, whatever it can be. Uh, in America, there's a thing happening now, uh, other parts of the world as well, but I've seen it in America where people do living room concerts yeah. where uh, yes. you know they all share in a, they go to different people's houses and with, with something small like an acoustic guitar or very small speakers and a DJ and yeah. and uh, so yeah, there's all you know it's, it's uh, whatever one can think of. Yes, exactly. Звичайно, питання у мене було логічне так з академії як. Артист навчився в академії, став артистом, і як йому зробити це в ком'юніті, це суспільство. Каже, дуже просто, треба щось робити. Наприклад, можна піти, як по кафе, що ми вчора були, хтось, хтось робить поезію, хтось робить музику, але вже однодумці. І там вже робиться колаборація, і вже відчувається якийсь артист. 
В Америці є такі речі, зараз дійсно є, де вдома, в квартирі збирається дуже мало людей, і вони роблять маленькі концерти. Таким чином ці концерти розвивають ідеї, і артисти потім знаходяться один з одним, і роблять це ком'юніті, і за цього вже робиться інтерес. Я абсолютно згодом. Інфакті, в нашій академії, одна з наших фундацій є про це. Це про створення ком'юніті, дати людям експресити себе. We never don't let them do that. And by doing so, the community will choose the artist. And the artist will become within the community. It's a natural synthesis. Uh, and I think the social media is probably going to be a service to that. It comes than... after, I think. Exactly. The other people, when they put it first, it's, yeah. not, it's not so yeah. positive. But after, it's useful after, yes. to follow the story. Well, when the artist is doing their society, then Facebook and so on works as a service for them. А не навпаки. Тому розуміння, як використовувати цю, цю нову технологію, дуже важливо зараз, що треба спочатку бути артистом, мати свою ком'юніті, і потім вже мати Facebook, розвивати ком'юніті, within the community. And технологія просто має допомагати. Well, very interesting. Uh, I think I got my chest of the answers out. Uh, I think uh, oh, maybe... questions. Yes, we, so we should take questions, and uh, we probably have another 15 minutes, and uh, Great. we'll finish our... Conference. If you have any questions, please ask them. Hello. Um, I'd like to ask a question about your cooperation and uh, the financial thing. Great. Um, how often do you yeah, collaborate yeah. with the artist, uh, being not paid in advance, but having a royalty share, I mean the publisher, right. Uh, the right to share or something like that, percent in the publishing rights? Yeah, historically, uh, when I began, the early part of the story, the, there was no money. When I would go to a club in the yeah, beginning, right. find a band, I would do that song for free at night. Uh, and from there, it built up a repertoire. And uh, some of that music I used at the very beginning of my own record label. Again, paying to then press it. Uh, uh, and, and back then, building its own community as well. The, uh, um, now, most of the music that I make that is speculative like that is my own. But... Uh, I then, so if I'm going to do a project for someone else, like the James Blunt album that came out last fall, uh, I work with him, he has a label, a budget, that's great, that's a good use of my time, because I can be compensated for it at this point. Uh, but when I also still like to make music for the sheer pleasure of it, I'll make, I'll think, I hear a song, I think, oh, I should take this old classic song and make a new version of it, and I can play it when I DJ, it'll be really fun. And then I think of all my friends, and, and so I collaborate in that sense. The free ones that I'm doing now are more making something I want to play live and then asking my friends to, uh, to guest on it. And uh, yeah, yeah, very fun. And, that, and then beyond that, uh, the other thing that I like to do, because it's not, at this point, it's not so much, one just came up the other week and I was so tempted to do it, a speculo song with a really neat uh, uh, English drummer. Uh, but we ended up not doing it. Now, what I prefer to do when I meet people, such as yourself, is to, if they want to work on something speculatively, I prefer to uh, just help advise and put people together. Because with my experience, I think I have enough experience recording songs, but if you say, I want to make a song with you, I'd say, okay, well, who are your friends? What's your community that you have already? Okay, he knows how to record, or he has a friend who has a studio. Okay, great, well, I'll help you guys put it together. And uh, I think that's a more valuable use of my experience is to share it with people so that they can start their own journey because uh, I'm, I'm far down mine and uh, yeah and very happy uh, DJing. <laughs> what, what is the source of your um, um, innovation and your inspiration? Uh, the uh, uh, it, it, you know, for me, in the beginning, I was very, very awkward. Uh, it's a bit like going on your first date or your first school dance, you know, you sort of, uh, you're just trying to make something that even sounds like anything. And, uh, uh, and uh, so, as you start to develop your own ability and that trust starts to build within yourself, then the inspiration can, ultimately, it comes from anywhere. Uh, I, yesterday I was here at the hotel after we did a day of interviews and I went back to take a shower and after I turned the shower off and I lay back on the bed I heard this and it was the drip, I was, what is that? I went back, it was a drip coming out of the shower 
ってチュッチュッチュッチュッチュッチュッチュッチュッチュッチュッチュッチュッチュッチュッチュッチュッチュッチュッチWhy do you think、uh, the, the Ukrainian artists, or the popular artists, have never been nominated or won a Grammy, but yet、uh, people from Norway or Spain、uh, were nominated and actually won? Uh, I have I have no personal experience that would that would give me an answer to that. I don't know. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to consider. Not for me, but just in life. I think that a contest, when you have an award, in one way, if you have an award and there are three songs nominated for a Grammy, four songs nominated for a Grammy, and one song gets the Grammy, Does that mean that that song is better than the other three? Music's for everyone to enjoy, and you might like one song, I like the other one, we disagree on which one's better, or which for us, which one's better. So、uh, I don't know, but、uh, I, I personally, it's, it's ironic because I have been,、uh, I've received lots of、uh, accolades and nominations and, and awards for the work that I've done, but I don't, and it's nice to be recognized, but I don't necessarily. With music and art, I don't so much believe in the awards. I like the awards when there's a car race. <laughs> that car is first. That was the best to do that day. I like that.、Yeah. Uh, sports, I like the awards. But in, in art, I'm not so sure about the awards.、Uh, yeah. It's nice to be recognized, but in America, the Grammys, you know, the Grammys are, have, there's, they have huge, the truth of the Grammys is, It's, what I love about the Grammys is it gets all the artists together in one performance. And if you go to the Grammys, I've been fortunate enough to go to the awards ceremony before, and you get to see all these different artists in one night. And that's beautiful to see, and the excitement of everybody being there, and all these different、uh, creators in one room.、Uh, but on the, the, reali- the other reality of the Grammys, for instance, is that、uh, it's voted on by a collective body of professionals. I, I'm able to vote on the Grammys. Some years I do, some years I'm traveling and I don't vote.、Uh, But the reality is, the biggest music corporations, and there's only three, the biggest music corporation of three has the most votes. And when you win a Grammy, it's not so much anymore because nobody buys music. That's the good, that's the good news. <laughs> because when, back in the CD days, 10 years ago, it made a difference. Yeah, well, all the labels, they wanted, to, they wanted the award just to make the money.、Yeah. So、uh, obviously, in America, they're going to vote predominantly, the corporations are going to vote for their own acts. But occasionally, that, in a certain category, that giant corporation, May have a foreign record nominated. So they're going to they're gonna tell everybody in their company, like, okay, this time we've got this Norwegian act up for this award and we don't have any, anything else on that, so let's vote for the Norwegian one. So it becomes, it becomes political.、Uh, and, yeah, uh, that's, that's a good answer. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, yes, I'm sure. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> Да, потом объяснил, он знает почему. А, а, в чем дело? Дело в том, что, например, вот если кто-то идет на номинацию Грамми, скажем, есть альбом. Вот эта песня номинирована, это вот эта, да, есть там 3-4 песни, и только одна выигрывает. Если одна выигрывает, это не значит, что, что другие плохие песни. А, поэтому, потому что мы по-другому чувствуем музыку все. А, то есть это не значит, что эта песня лучше других, или там что-то делается. Uh, он был на много Грамми, видел, как оно все делается, он понимает. Грамми это, это очень хор- хорошая награда, потому что это,、uh, это действительно как бы со- это собрание креативных музыкантов мира, и они、uh, голосуют за правильного человека.、Uh, но правда в другом. Правда в том, что, например, сейчас、uh, есть три самые большие компании записывающие. И вот эти три компании... 
Они существуют только из-за того, чтобы продать музыку. И как они продают музыку? Грэмми, они используют Грэмми для того, чтобы продать музыку. То есть, если это ну, в то время, но сейчас уже нет вот CD, тогда да, вот это вот правда. То есть, когда CD есть, и его нужно продать, они у, в Грэмми, вот, вот этих компаниях, или Warner Bros, или Sony, или Universal, у них, на, у них наиболее членов Грэмми, которые голосуют. И они делают лобби, которые голосуют за их же релиз. Так? И таким образом набирается очень много голосов за их релиз, которые они хотят продать. И в то время, когда они, они голосуют за Грэмми, прода, продается этот релиз. А, в, объяснение для Испании или для Норвегии то же самое. То есть вот эти компании имеют там свои представительства, и они, и они хотят продать там в Испании Пулио Глассиус. Они берут и продают его на Грэмми. Так? Его голосование. Таким образом, Идет э, фокус на хулиоглассис, и он продается. Вот так он работает. Дело в том, что и у нас есть и Sony, и Warner Bros. Но у нас нет представителей. Это нет. Я вам скажу, я, я тоже знаю. Здесь... Я говорю, когда ну, о, ну, все равно русскоязычных э, исполнителях и музыкантах, это большая аудитория и большая как бы... Да. Для продаж, для всего. Почему? Представители здесь, Universal, например, Sony, они работают, чтобы продать проекты с Америки, с Англии. Они не работают, чтобы продать украинские проекты наоборот. Поэтому мы делаем это отдельно. Они работают наоборот. То есть это как бы дистрибьюторы их проектов сюда. И если они подписывают кого-то отсюда, оно не будет продаваться там. Они же берут это Атланта и здесь же его продают. То есть это, это называется аутсорсинг такой. То есть эти, эти компании не заинтересованы для того, чтобы продавать... Потому что у нас очень низкий уровень, правильно? Ну, я об этом не, не думаю. Я, я думаю, просто компании не заинтересованы. Я думаю, Том прав, я его поддерживаю в том, что э, не нужно смотреть на компании, а нужно смотреть то, что мы можем сделать. И это намного лучше. И кстати, это будущее, очень близкое. Оно уже это делает. И вы, кстати, уже экземпляр этого. Поэтому э, можно делать, развиваться по-другому, интегрироваться, как мы это делаем на Академии, интегрироваться с, с людьми, ну, профессионалами, которые записывают ну, компании, покупают, чтобы что-то продать. In, uh, in 2007, James Blunt, Back to Bedlam album, mm -hmm. songs from that, yeah. five uh, Grammy nominations. Yeah. End of 2006, the awards the beginning of 2007. Yeah. Was there? Remember? Oh yeah. I actually met him that night. Yes. Ah. Mm -hmm. I was there too. There's a good shot of me photobombing behind him and Silo. <laughs> I look like I'm security. Yeah, Silo was the, there. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we have five nominations, including uh, record or song of the year. One of the, the three highest album, record, and song are the three highest awards. Yeah. And uh, but uh, apparently Warner's didn't have the voting power because five nominations, we we walked away with zero, nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So why does that, and that was the biggest album in the world right then, so why does the biggest album in the world, you know, uh, get zero? That's so, a very good point. So it's, uh, yeah. So it, what, what, what exemplar, как оно работает? Например, он делал uh, Back to Bedlam, uh, James Blunt альбом. В 2007 году номинация была в 2006-м, Грэмми тут на год позже. Номинирован на 5 Грэмми. И главный Грэмми — это песня года, это альбом года, и артист года. И все три, три были у Джеймс Бланта. Все три. Но он был подписан до Атлантика. Атлантик — это Warner Brothers. И Warner Brothers — маленький лейбл. И у них не было достаточно votes, чтобы сделать Грэмми. То есть он взял все номинации и ничего не выиграл. The, the most important thing uh, — the music. Like uh, the awards, the social media, lay after. Yeah. First the music. Yeah. И на самом деле он продал, он продал наибольше после него в этом году. Но не выиграл Грэмми, понимаете? Самая любимая песня до, 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 до сих пор многих людей, они выиграют Грэмми. Я вам еще одну историю скажу. Это очень интересная история. Yeah, awards are yeah. like the, the cupcake, the icing on top, maybe. Yeah, yeah. awards, да, я, я, я согласен. Awards, uh, они как бы это хорошо иметь, они, они дают credibility, но на самом деле uh, они, не, они не дают uh, то, что людям нравится. Не обязательно, скажем так. Uh, я одну историю скажу. I, I, I have one yeah. story. Yeah. Uh, Uh, а я, у меня друг Стив Вайт, гитарист, и мы с ним в кафе едим, и он мне говорит, ты знаешь, Влад, вот я не понимаю, как это, Led Zeppelin, группа, которая, на, на какой я вырос, 
не имеют никакого гами. Они продали очень много всего. Все их знают, а никакого, даже ничего, даже номинации нет в Украине. А он, а он тогда был в 2007 году, он был председатель Грэмми в Лос-Анджелесе. И я не мог поверить, действительно, я бы проверил, нет никакого Грэмми. Как это может быть? Группа, которая делает вдохновение всем на земле, которая сделала блуз популярным, которая сделала рок популярным, которая всех повторяет, как, как это значит? Так он что сделал? Как он был председатель Грэмми, он не мог вот им сделать сам за всех, так? И он сделал такую, такую специальную вещь, как uh, uh, honorary, то есть uh, почестный Грэмми, как бы такой, они дали им как бы такую грамоту, что вот мы, им, мы их признаем как Грэмми. А на самом деле их даже не номинировали. So the story I was telling, uh, Steve I, who was a friend, and, uh, he, and he was the chairman of Grammy of Los Angeles chapter. Right. Yes, and, yeah. Yeah, and he was telling me a story, he said, um, Led Zeppelin. Apparently, they never even got nominated for a Grammy. That's right. Yeah. And and he was appalled. How is it possible? A band that inspired millions sold every album. Led Zeppelin was multi platinum album yeah. for 25 million records, and none of the Grammys. So so he couldn't so he couldn't vote obviously for for everybody. So he just made an honorary kind of award. Ah, that's how that started. Yes. Ah, it's a good story. Yeah. And he made an honorary award, and they. <laughs> Uh, yeah. There you go. I can teach it to too. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then eventually that's that's how they got the honorary uh, yeah, award. became yes. a regular thing. And that's why they came to Grammys and they got the award. So, эта история, она поучительна в том плане, что мы уже все имеем. Здесь есть таланты, уже все есть, но нужно развивать, как это все делать, чтобы действительно иметь культуру, которая будет экспортироваться в ту же Америку и в ту же Голландию. Yeah, тогда, тогда. Правильно. Вот я об этом сегодня лекцию как раз говорил, да, пропустили. И вот там как раз мы говорили, как сделать культурный э, экспорт. И что Америка экспортирует? Она как раз экспортирует культуру. И мы как раз вот этим будем заниматься. Да, да. Вот, а, такой вопрос. А знаете ли том, каких там еще украинских исполнителей? Uh -huh. И нравятся ли они ему? И может быть какие-то ну, есть популярные в Америке uh -huh. украинские исполнители? Uh -huh. Big question. Do you know any of Ukrainian uh, artists that you like? For example, all you heard of and you like them? Yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> uh, yeah. When we had coffee with Slava, I really yeah. enjoyed. Not only uh, I hadn't heard his music before, but I enjoyed his personality so much that I went and listened to the music, and I really liked it. Yeah. And I liked the conversation, like the idea of uh, the Ukrainian folk melody with uh, with mm -hmm. the American blues guitar yeah. that we talked about at coffee yes, last about. year. Yeah. And so, uh, so I hope we get to uh, work on that at some point. Absolutely. Um, Кофе и Славиком, Вакарчук, Вакарчуком. Ему понравилась его энергия. И он даже не знал, как он поет, но ему энергия ему понравилась. Из-за этого он, он пошел на YouTube, чтобы посмотреть, как он поет. И ему понравилось, как он поет. Вот ему действительно этот артист понравился. Он, кстати, у нас была идея, чтобы сделать фольклорную музыку украинскую из слайд-гитары. Как бы, артист, которого мы встретили вчера, она здесь. Sings the R and B. The R and B. Yes, uh, she was at the conference yeah, earlier. Yeah, there was someone here earlier that we met yesterday. Yes, yes. So, yeah. Yeah, she was actually nice. I, I forgot her name. And I was I was saying earlier that's uh I for me it uh, it's always the personal connection in person yes. meeting someone uh, like the artist yesterday, like Slava. Yeah. Well, for example, we met yesterday an artist. I forgot. Unfortunately, Wasabi. Yes, Wasabi. Uh, васаби, и ему понравился вот, вот персонаж, это не персонаж, а персона этого человека. И из-за этого мне, ему бы уже интересно было услышать, как она поет. Потому что энергия человека, она уже дает задание, как она может петь и так далее. И вот, а он персонально только так и работает. То есть если ему нравится человек, он будет с ним работать и делать хороший проект. Mm -hmm. yeah, простите, я хотел бы точку вот в этой истории поставить mm -hmm. по поводу мейджоров. Да. Да. Uh, в Украине есть Universal Music Group, mm -hmm. и у него есть собственные артисты, yeah. и которых uh, я там работаю просто уже mm -hmm. уже этим тоже. Вот. И у нас есть достаточный успех с локальными артистами вот, uh, с территории Европы, по всему mm -hmm. Royal Hill, mm -hmm. и авторские права. Yeah. Вот. Поэтому как бы не совсем так. Компании mm -hmm. как бы не пытаются заботиться. Более того, если брать не Грэмми, а другие конкурсы, допустим, 
вырубил мне лихо в воздухе, если я не ошибаюсь, то одна из страны, там была рука на 2010 году. Ну вот там один из критериев это официальный трудак. То есть если у тебя есть там, 50 тысяч проданных официальных людей, да, тогда ты имеешь право участвовать в этом вопросе. Может быть, это проблема из времени. Смотрите, so this is something about a local uh, branch of Universal. Okay. And the local branch of Universal obviously signs the artists and supports the artists and develops them. Great. And they even have the royalties coming from uh, other countries. Good. Nice. And they have nominated even one artist for Slana at the World Music Awards and because of the sales. And she had the sales. And the question and the debate was uh, still about the Grammy. Uh, why, uh, why the World Music Awards gets these artists and uh, the Grammys doesn't? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't know. I only, I only have the uh, I only have the experience of, uh, and even I don't understand why some things that I've worked on. I yeah. use the example of Back to Bedlam. I don't understand why some things I've worked on get a nomination. Some things don't. So uh, uh, yeah, and always, uh, and you know, and maybe a part of me isn't interested even in investigating because always more interested in the music than the awards. Sometimes they happen, sometimes they don't. Another thing that used to really torture me too is sometimes you make music and it goes on its journey around the world, you don't know what's happening, but somebody hears a song that you make and they decide they want to put it in a television commercial. And that's great because it gives you exposure and it gives you money. Uh, but the first few times that happened, I got so excited and then it didn't happen. You know, they put another song in. And so after a while you're like, well, you just wait and see. It's all fine afterwards. Like after the words are over, we'll see if we have an award. Uh, after the television commercial's out, we'll see if our music made it. Same thing for a film. Song goes in a film, well, we'll see when the film comes out if it's still in there. And then, and in the meantime, we just we make music. Он персонально не очень-то интересуется там всякими awards, то есть он интересуется музыкой больше. А на самом деле, как он все делал, оно шло так, что или делаешь там музыку для кино, или делаешь музыку для альбома, а в конце концов, когда уже есть продукт, уже интересно, но там, там возьмет какой-то э, наоборот ученый весьма. То есть на самом деле, но Том ему как бы не интересно э, такие вещи. Я всегда могу сказать э, то же самое. Я был номинирован, номинирован на Грамме из-за того, что я был подписан на американской компании. Э, это тоже дает этого. Э, но поверьте, без музыки никакая... у нас 12 тысяч людей, которые голосуют за Грамме. Как можно 15 тысяч профессионалов так, сказать, что давайте вот мы сделаем такое. Плюс у нас еще есть voting member, который там, это профессионал, который выпускает пластинки там для всяких звезд самых больших. Да? И они работают как продюсерами, как songwriters, как инженерами на большие компании. И большие компании делают такие всякие вещи, которые там промоцию для них и так далее. То есть э, дата политическая, но в то же время э, без продукта невозможно. Потому что этот продукт будет показываться всему миру и сказать, что Грэмми стоит за этим продуктом, будет сложно. Поэтому продукт – это первоначально. Я только коммерческие, как бы, да. коммерческие да. Но я уверен в том, что, смотрите, когда Украина будет делать экспортированную культуру, тогда и Грэмми заметит, и компания Universal, я понимаю, что вы работаете в компании Universal, опять же, Universal за пределами э, Германии, Они работают как представители Universal, это не Universal, это украинцы, которые работают, да. Поэтому они, а Universal, как corporate agenda, у них э, очень простая. Идут, берут рынок и продают им же. То есть, ну, вот зачем, вот посмотрите, как очень интересно, мы, мы это будем учить в бизнес-классе, то есть, смотрите, как будет интересно можно сделать. Universal при, пришли сюда, взяли партнера украинского, открыли локальный офис, так? Well, excuse me. I enjoy a Q&A. I'm going to get myself a cup of coffee and I'll be right back. So you, you answer the next question, I'll be yes, right back. Okay. Q&A, I'll be right back. In a, in a second, I'll push it quickly. When there is a company that is here, Ukrainian, and will develop Ukrainian artists, first for Ukraine, not for Universal, for Ukraine, and then have such a product that is already interesting, as an exportable product, Туда Universal придет и скажет, а может вот, вот купить у вас этот продукт с компанией вместе? И мы скажем, нет. Почему? Потому что у нас будет выигрышный вариант. Да? И эта бизнес-модель, она всегда работает. То есть, когда экспортированная модель, есть что экспортировать, когда есть интеграция, мы это занимаемся как раз, тогда уже можно разговаривать реальный бизнес в мире. 
ПК такой модели здесь не, до нас не, не существовало. То есть нет представителей. Есть дистрибьюторы, есть, есть офисы и так, далее, и так далее. То есть нет людей, заинтересованных, украинских артистов, чтобы взять мир. Наоборот. Понимаете? Да. Можно? Да, конечно. Просто вот вы правильно сказали по поводу корпоративной стратегии. Да, да. Просто мы 10 лет работали с EMI. Ну, вот, да. знаете, EMI... Я был подписан на EMI в 96-м году. И, соответственно, у EMI была другая стратегия. Они, кстати, очень, очень интересовались локальным рынком и поддерживали все вот начинания. EMI это первая, первая, да. первая записывающая компания, которая упала в первой в Америке. Почему? Потому что они вообще не понимали, что артист делает. Я это могу сказать, потом поделят, и все артисты со мной это скажут. Дело в том, что... Американский EMI. Да, американский EMI. Дело в том, что это самая большая компания, как вы понимаете, в мире. И из-за из того, что они не понимают, что такое артист. Корпорации и артист – совершенно другие вещи. Люди, которые... Я вот так скажу, такую одну историю от меня. Я работал с таким музыкантом, называется Тони Беннет. Это как... Фрэнк Синатра, но Тони Бен. Это последний, <смех> последний из тех, кто поет джазовые песни. И ему 87 лет уже, я, ему, я с ним работал тогда, ему было 84. И э, работали над музыкой, он делает стандартные американские песни. Просили меня, чтобы я там копродюсировал дуэт альбом, мы делали дуэт. Ноки там знаменитости, и YouTube были все там знаменитости. И, и мы с ним подружились на этом проекте. Подружились на этом проекте, и он мне сказал такую историю. В 1950 году его подписали Columbia Records, как артиста, чтобы был артист. В то время развивали артиста 9 лет. Сейчас, Ермак вам может сказать, никто не будет развивать вообще, если у тебя нет, нет аудитории. Поэтому совершенно другая была атмосфера в корпоративе. Да? То есть люди, которые занимались музыкальным бизнесом, были меломаны музыки. Okay? 1964 год. Битлз номер один в Америке. Никто не понимает этот Битлз, потому что музыка очень громкая, как бы черная, но белые играют люди, какие-то мальчики какие-то непонятные. И, и девочкам это все нравится. И одна компания, неизвестная, называется Apple Records в Нью-Йорке. Сделала с ними большой кампейн, поставила на телевидение и сделала большая группа. В то время, в 1966 году, новый адвокат с Columbia University, называется Клай Дэвис, идет в компанию Columbia, его нанимают и говорят, ну, вам нужно почистить артиста, потому что нужно так, чтобы как Битлз зарабатывать, нам нужно так зарабатывать. Это, это корпоративный менталит, то есть где музыка, а где, а где корпорат. Okay? Конечно, как корпорат адвокат, он идет и говорит, так, кто здесь не зарабатывает? Ага, джазовые музыканты, так как Битлз не зарабатывает. Значит, ну, их нужно убрать. Значит, он пошел к Дюк Эллингтон. Дюк Эллингтон. Подходит Дюк Эллингтон и говорит, слушай, Дюк, ты можешь сыграть песни Битлз? А он говорит, а кто такой Битлз? А он говорит, вы что, не знаете, что такое Битлз? Они продают номер один всюду. А он говорит, так мне как бы все равно, кто продает номер один. Я играю то, у меня аудитория. А он говорит, но, 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 вы знаете, если вы не будете играть Битлз, мы, вам, вы, мы вас уволим. Дюк Эллингтон говорит им, вы знаете, как, как тебя звать? Он говорит, Клай Дэвис. Вы, вы перепутали, как у нас бизнес работает. Я музыкант, я делаю музыку, а ваша проблема ее продавать, не наоборот. И он встал и ушел. Он стал не легендой, но навсегда. Вот этот экземпляр, который мне Тони Беннет рассказал, я всегда помню сейчас. Очень сильно помню, потому что я понимаю, что такое талант, как его развивать, как сделать так, чтобы людям было хорошо от музыки, а не наоборот. Так? Как, как сделать так, чтобы было вдохновение в жизни, интеграция. Вот, вот, мы смотрим сейчас на Украину. Да? Что в Украине делается? Страшные вещи делаются. Мы делаем то, что никто не дает Украине. Вдохновение. Украине нужно вдохновение, чтобы сделать что-то для себя, для людей. Чтобы люди почувствовали, что есть жизнь. Да? Если есть жизнь, есть будущее. Если есть талант, уже есть экспорт. И если есть уже профессия, это уже бизнес. Вот эти все вещи, они, они все вза взаимопровязаны. И я не хочу, чтобы никакой талант 
в Украине, или он какой-то корпорат, вот какой вы ремарк, вот вы боитесь за, за, за корпорацию, на самом деле у вас все, все в порядке, просто да. да. Поэтому как бы ну, нужно делать так, чтобы людям экспертиз, чтобы экспорт понимал, что у нас есть что-то интересное, или это в ритме, или это что-то интересное в звуке, или что-то интересное в артисте, чтобы все на земле, как Майкл Джексон, понимали. Вот это был экспортивный продукт культуры. То же самое здесь. А мы для меня Украина очень классная, даже в историческом плане. Я не знаю, ли вы знаете, но Голливуд был established украинцем, с Киева и с Одессы. MGM, это с Одессы, и Universal, это с Киева. То есть вот такие вещи, зачем нужно ехать в Америку, чтобы такое делать? Так? То есть есть же люди, есть. Так нужно делать. Я экземпляр тоже. Тоже, тоже экземпляр, я вырос в Калуше, в Амшиковской области, и когда мне было там 20 с чем-то, куда приехал, я не мог выехать, выехать из Америки, потому что паспорт был советский, а здесь, в Украине, они не давали выезд. Так мне вышло, что застрял. Но на самом деле, музыканты, я делал только то. И была такая атмосфера, что мне как бы, понравилась моя музыка. А на самом деле, я же тоже человек, как и вы, как мы все, там, там тоже, только английский язык. А, поэтому нету такого, что кто-то сверху скажет нельзя. Нужно, чтобы снизу всегда говорили да. И вот эта поддержка снизу главнее, чем сверху сказать да. И вот эволюция, кстати, показывает это. Поэтому мы это поддерживаем как и культурный момент, и музыкальный момент. И Том это делал тоже, как вы видите. То есть я думаю, I just think that this is a very uh, great lesson in, in the audience in the sense that uh, that you opened up a little bit of a Pandora box here. Uh, a glimpse into what really is important. And the importance is, as we all know, it's, it's doing what we love to do. Music and making people happy. Creating a church of happiness, right? <laughs> and um, by doing this, the inspiration of the world is going to be just nothing but uniting the best that we can do on that platform. What do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, that's the... That is the gig, isn't it? Do, yeah. do the best you can do. <laughs> the best you can do. Yeah, help people out. When you help people out, it usually comes back to you in some way or other. I helped my yeah. old roommate with his demo, and the guy ran off with it, but then uh, suddenly exactly. I was working with Brett Michaels, and my own experience, but I think we all, it all comes around, yeah. 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 That's good. Did you have a question? Если верите ли вы в то, что на украинском языке можно экспортировать музыку в, на территорию всего мира mm -hmm. и, в ту же, и в ту же Америку, yeah, yeah, да, mm -hmm. и, или же украинским артистам придется петь на английском, чтобы стать экспортируемыми? It depends, you know, where it's going to be popular. Obviously, it would be popular in Russia, uh, possibly. The uh, and if you want to be, you know, most of the songs that are popular in the United States or England are, are sung in English. Uh, instrumental songs can break the rules because, of course, music is a is a universal language, and uh, we're all people. We all have the same emotions, so we're looking to connect on that. So uh, I once did a song with James Blunt that we translated into Spanish because he was going to do a, a tour in South America and he wanted to send something ahead that said that uh, as, a, as a show of appreciation for the people coming to his concert that he was making an effort to communicate in their language. So I think that the, you have to take into account where you want to go. Uh, I wouldn't expect to... Uh, well, first of all, you'll never hear me sing because I'm terrible. But if I did, I wouldn't expect to sing English and have a hit in, in, uh, in, uh, in Finland. Uh, perhaps, yeah, would, yeah. and uh, so uh, yeah. So I think that you, yeah, I think that musically, yeah, you can if you can if you're speaking universally, you can communicate anywhere in the world, uh, yeah. instrumentally. And then when it comes to language, uh, and, and and finally, personally, I'm a fan of songs that have a bit of both because I love to be exposed to a new language, but mm -hmm. I also need something I can understand as well. Yeah. So I like both. That's good answer. Uh, Tom говорит, что да, действительно, если вы имеете лирику на русском, это будет популярно в России. Если лирику на английском, это будет в Англии, в Америке и так далее. Джеймс uh, Бланк, например, вот он делал 
концерт в Бразилии, и он хотел сделать песню на испанском языке, на португальском, чтобы, чтобы люди его поняли. И он специально это сделал. А, то есть вот такая интеграция, да. Это да, да, yeah, yeah. да. а, Где-то там что-то сделать. То есть в таком плане он, он как бы понимает интеграцию. В другом плане инструментальная музыка не имеет никакой лирики, поэтому она имеет больше шансов для понимания всего, так? Персонально то он э, любит песни, которые имеют и так, и так. Что-то в том, что я понимаю, и что-то экзотическое, что я не понимаю. Ну, просто в украинском языке есть уникальность, есть там какая-то изюминка, да? А так это попытки всех наших артистов на английском языке петь, которые приводят я... к да. усмешкам со стороны рекордов и всех остальных. Ну, у меня друг другой ответ будет чуть-чуть. Я персонально люблю экзотические вещи, потому что они меня делают такой сюрприз. То есть, если музыкально подать что-то экзотическое, оно, я даже не понимаю, что, о, чем, о чем они говорят, но если музыкально оно сделано правильно и честно, и весело, экземпляр, я уже говорю, экземпляр, Псай. Слышали такого артиста? Псай. Номер один артист в мире. Номер один в Америке. Это невозможно, чтобы номер один артист в Америке был то, что не понимает английский язык. И он это сделал. То есть вот эта интеграция для меня, это экземпляр интеграции. Это, новое, это новая интеграция, которую я вижу. Почему? Потому что эмоция музыки была всем понятна. И все нюансы с продюсированием, как оно сделано, смешно, не смешно, все остальное... Все на земле было понятно. И вот это для меня называется экспортивная культура. Сейчас мы знаем корейскую культуру из Апсая. До того мы Корее даже не знали, что это что-то есть. Да? Вот то же самое дело здесь можно. То есть вот не то же самое, у нас же не такие, как Апсая, у нас много интереснее люди. И интереснее по, по талантам. Но нужно развивать идеи. от чего, по его мнению, зависит коммерческий успех uh -huh. песни. Вот. И э, за какой музыкой вообще будущее? Потому что сейчас, okay. как он говорил, вы говорили, uh -huh. что идет смешение, те же поп-артисты, они сотрудничают с диджеями, Авичи, Келвин Харрис, yeah. многие песни становятся известными только после сотрудничества с диджеями. Да? Yeah. Хотя сами по себе артисты ну, как бы могут быть недостаточно яркими. Вот такой вопрос интересный. А, а первый как был? А первый вопрос, от чего зависит коммерческий успех песни, uh -huh. по его мнению? So, it's, it's two questions. Uh, the first question, what's the success, like, what is the uh, core of uh, song success, what it depends on? And the second one is, uh, how do you see the future of the successful song? Um, uh, what? What's the element that makes a song and yeah, a successful. successful song possesses, yes. I suppose? Yeah. Uh, music's a communication exercise, so a song is usually pushing on a primary emotion. If you can really find out what that emotion is and go deep into it, and the song really is to make you feel good and happy and have a drink at a club, or whether it's to make you feel sad and remember some big loss in your life, that's the purpose of a song. And a, and a, a song that connects with people, it becomes a hit song. Yeah. There's no such thing as a hit song until after. It's kind of like an award, the hit comes later. But if the song's a clear communication, then it has the potential to reach people. If reach people, then you call it a hit. Uh, and the definition of that now it continues to change. And it's a bit of everything now, right? You can look at radio, you can look at YouTube, Spin, SoundCloud, etc. There's You just add up how much it appears to be connecting with people. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, the more connection, the, uh, that's the definition of success. Mm -hmm. Uh, ну, первая часть, это, чтобы была успешная песня, она, она должна идти в середину эмоций. Не, не имеет значения, какая эмоция, там, веселая или, сус, или сусумная, но должна быть эмоция. Без эмоций она не будет сексуальна. А уже там, сколько она продалась, какой там хит или не хит, уже, это уже второстепенно. То есть, ну, когда все понятно людям, эмоция очень понятная, тогда это будет, это будет успешная песня. Второе, что сейчас делается, это когда делается песня, он думает, что успех должен быть всюду сейчас, через вот, ну, социальные вещи, SoundCloud, Facebook и так далее, чтобы люди э, имели доступ до этого всего. И в этом будет успех тоже. А может быть какой-то определенный стиль? То есть какая mm -hmm. тенденция? Uh, maybe, so there's a new genre, it's going to be developing in the future for the populace, it's a successful song. 
Я думаю, что это будет здорово, если будет такое. Как вы относитесь к классической музыке? И какой композитор, если у вас есть любимый композитор классический, назовите, пожалуйста. What do you like in classical music, and who is your favorite composer in classical music? Oh, oh, that's really tough. Uh, my classical knowledge is very small. Uh, you know, all the big ones, you know, there's pieces that I like, Beethoven, Mozart, the obvious ones. Vivaldi, uh, uh, right? I like, no. yeah. Uh, but, yeah, the, uh, uh, and that's about, that's about all I know in classical. But, uh, and how do you relate to classical music? Yeah, the question was part of it. Yeah, the, uh, well, when I was a child, I didn't connect with classical at all. It took a long time. It was in university, an art teacher would put on, he had a stack of classical records, and every day in class when we'd go to draw, he would just put on a classical record, and that's when I really, just while drawing and listening to classical music, that's when I started to, to much later in life, develop an appreciation for it. Yeah. And then, uh, for me, the the scale and emotion of classical music, the, the emotion that happens by so many people, it's the largest ensemble I've ever worked with, is an orchestra, uh, in the, for myself in the context of film. Uh, but that's, to me, that's what the amazing power of classical music. I understand why it used to be popular music before there was electricity harnessed, mm -hmm. because you put all those people together and you make this amazing acoustic sound, and uh, and there's no there's no substitute for that. All these yeah. people working together to do one thing, yeah. uh, amazingly powerful. Yeah. So yeah. Great, thank you. No, no, it's very simple. Он не знает хорошо классической музыки, но знает таких как Бетховен, там Моцарт, все, что он знает, и он слушает Вивальди много. Когда он был маленький, учился в школе, у него учитель очень любил и ставил все классические пластинки. Он работал с классическими оркестрами для кино в Голливуде, когда делал саундтреки. И он, ему это очень нравилось, как оркестр звучит. И он понимает, почему ну, классический оркестр – это такая структура, где очень много скрипок и так, далее, и так далее, потому что не было электричества еще тогда. И было бы тихо, и так не собирались, поэтому композиция была такие гранды, большие. И в это ему очень нравится, что оно такое свежее и большое это все. Артист большой, маленький, большой. Ага, Василий. Такой, такой, такой. 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 How does the schedule look for the, for the artist? Let's say, how much time, percentage-wise, uh, he spends at home, touring, studio, uh, appearances? It, it depends on the artist, but of course there's a lot of, profet, uh, a lot of pressure to work a lot. Uh, and you can fill a schedule uh, completely crazy. I have one group of friends that nobody knows of. They're called, they're, they live in Colorado in the mountains. And there's four of them and they have a bluegrass band playing traditional American music, sort of, their, their modern interpretation of it. Uh, they're called Yonder Mountain String Band. And uh, they make an amazing living, and they always go out on a bus, and they all own houses, and they have families. And, uh, and they have a community that they've built up over 10 years. And they go, and they go one month on the road, and then they come home for a month, and they go back and forth. And that's how they found their balance. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Brett Michaels, who I mentioned earlier, who gave me a, a big start, he still, he's now in his 50s, and he still to this day does over 200 shows a year publicly, plus privates and corporates on top of that. So he works all the time, and, and he also has children, but he's completely driven. He, his comfort zone is on the road. Yeah. And Yonder Mountain, they, they found the balance. Half the time on the road, half the time private. Есть такая группа, называется Yonder Mountain. Они делают uh, Bluegrass, популярная группа в Америке. У них, вот, например, вот, есть такой свой скетчл, например, они один месяц на гастролях, один месяц отдыхают и делают все свои вещи. То есть они себе так выбрали, такой баланс. И у них аудитория из-за этого тоже так же и распределена. И, например, такой артист, как Брэд Майклс, Брэд Пойзен, и он имеет две, там 200 с чем-то концертов в год. И у него все дети, и семья, но и у него баланс в том, что он работает очень много, ему уже 50 с чем-то лет, и он только так и занимается. То есть это относительно то, как хочет делать. 
Я думаю, что уже нужно, мы очень забрели во времени, и нужно у нас первую конференцию заканчивать. Мы можем еще поразговаривать в коридоре, объяснить какие-то ситуации, но конференцию мы будем уже заканчивать, потому что время уже очень поздно. Том, я благодарю вас очень much for coming here to the opening. Welcome to the Academy. Uh, если есть какие-то вопросы, есть девочки, у нас уже открыто, официальное открытие у нас уже сегодня. Набираем уже семестр с 15 января, что все у нас уже работает. Так что, welcome. Uh, thank you.